Arno Hecht is a sax player and the founding member of the Uptown Horns, the legendary New York City-based horn section. He has played with countless artists, including the Rolling Stones, Chuck Berry, Robert Plant, James Brown, Tom Waits, the Jay Giles Band, Dion, Joan Jett, Iggy Pop, the B-52s, Buster Poindexter, Ray Charles, B.B. King, Pat Benatar, Ronnie Spector, the Allman Brothers, Darlene Love, Joe Cocker, Albert Collins, and more. So, let's join these two friends as they chat about the old times as well as future plans. Okay. How, how, how are the horns doing? You guys are still... Uh... We're still rocking and rolling, still doing stuff. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think. We have a kick coming up with a, a, a thing called the Hollywood All-Stars, uh-huh. where they uh, they cut four tunes... Uh, one, in fact, and they and they covered one of one of the songs off our uh, CD. Um, a song called "Trust Me." I don't know. If, did you ever hear our CD? Yeah, for sure. I have a copy of it. Yeah, you know the the song they covered was uh, the "Trust Me" that uh-huh. had right, 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 which which had Keith on yeah, Keith yeah. Richards yeah, on Keith guitar is, and yep, Peter yep. Wolf on vocal. Yep, that was a great, uh, great that was a great album. Uh, oh, thank you very yeah, much. I mean, yeah, we, you know, you had Collins on it. It was a great, great album. Yeah, well, thank you. So we, um, uh, so we have uh, actually have a uh, a, show, a show coming up at the Wall Street Theater in let me, Norwalk, Connecticut. Uh-huh. That's uh, a cr- that, that, that's um, Crispin's uh, territory, huh? Uh, Crispin lives up there. Yep, yeah, he yeah. lives up. That sort of general neck of the woods. Yeah. Uh, could be, so it's a convenient gig for him in that respect. Yeah. Hey, um, tell him you want a room that night in his house. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's commutable, so I, uh-huh. I, I don't have a problem. I know, I know, I know, I know. So we, um, me and you kind of grew up in the same um, um, stomping grounds, Queens, right? Queens, yes. Yeah. And, uh, Where'd I, you go to high school? Springfield Gardens. Oh, okay. I went to Jamaica High School. Okay, so we were neighbors. You know, we were pretty close. We were neighbors, yes. I, and, actually, uh, I, I actually went to um, elementary school in Jamaica, PS52, I believe it was. And, right. And there was an experiment back then to um, to kind of bus. Uh, um, they were trying to get, I guess, segregation happening. They, they, were, they were busing um, the Caucasian kids into Jamaica, which was right. a predominantly, you know, African-American uh, neighborhood. And uh, so yeah, so I went to high, so I went to uh, elementary school there, and then uh, two thirty one was my junior high school where they bust. I was I was Queens Village one oh nine. Yeah, yeah. So they bust their you know the um, African American kids into uh, um, our neighborhood, and then we kind of all merged in high school, and it was uh, quite the um, you know it was great. It was a great great uh, mixing um, platform. You know, you, you got to see how. Uh, you know, just every, how everybody was going to get along and everything else. It was definitely a, um, an eye opener, you know. Sure. Well, actually, you know, Jamaica there was there was, uh, it, there was just sort of a natural mix in terms of the uh, different zones that uh-huh. that went to school there, and it was a wonderful experience. And when I was um, uh, sophomore, Bob Beeman. Uh-huh. The Olympic champion, he broad jump champion, who like set the record for I don't know how many years. Right. Um, he he was uh, he was a senior there at the time, well. and the year behind me was uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, who's now this congresswoman. She she's yeah sure out of sure she's now. been yeah she's been around a long time, and she but she she was uh, a year behind me at Jamaica, and she was. Uh, oh. Way way back then, she was involved in like the student government and stuff. So yeah, she was then, definitely geared to that place. And then I, I used to go to day camp at Jackson Jackson Day Camp. There was Jackson Jackson, day camp, no. Jackson High School, right? Was it Jackson High School? That Andrew they, Jackson, yeah. Yeah, so they had a day camp there in the summer. That's they we used to go to day camp there, Jackson yeah. Day Camp, and um, yeah, those are great days. I found out, you know, Lenny White, the drummer. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Lenny uh, uh, lived in Laurelton, too. Oh, I didn't know. Well, a whole bunch, you know, from the general area. I mean, St. Albans was, yeah. you know, all, all kinds of heavy heavy people. In fact, the guy I used to um, 
when I was in high school, there was this relatively small shop um, that I used to go to get my sax work done. Uh, Coltrane used to go to him for it for for sax work. Oh wow! Yeah, so wow. I was I was an esteemed company. Yeah, yeah. And, and and you know James Brown came from Jamaica. You know, he did. That, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, he Jamaica Heights and. Um... Yeah, it was a great. It was a, definitely a great melting pot. It, it was definitely a lot going on, and a lot uh, going on. yeah, it was. So, um, how did you get involved in, in all this stuff? You, um, you know, your background and stuff, your folks and everything else. Well, it's let me see. My my folks were um, serious classical music uh, appreciators. They didn't play. Uh-huh. But they were they were very serious listeners, and they kind of had this little circle of friends who shared their enthusiasm. So when I was grow- like a kid, you know, growing up, it was like you know, like friends would you know, like friends would come over the house and sure. they'd bring like you know the the latest recording of Eric Leinstorf conducting the Boston Symphony or something like wow. that, and they'd 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 put it on the we'd put it. They, they put it on the hi fi. Right, 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 right. And, um. The hi fi bar and, unit, right? There was a hi fi with a bar built in? Uh, uh, not in my house, uh-huh. because, but we had a hi fi. Yeah, yeah, okay. And, uh, and, uh, they, um, unlike a lot of houses where people would just sort of put music on as a background, this was like, you know, they, they'd put this on and everybody would sit there without speaking and listen. Right. And, and if I and, like whatever other kid, you know, family, friends, kids were were would would get restless and make noise or something. Would be like, "Yo, go upstairs, play upstairs. We're listening here." Wow. So, um, so I kind of, I guess, I got my enthusiasm early. I mean, when I was when I was like, you know, three years old, you know, my dad would like carry me around, like you know, and I, I'd be able to tell you what you know, like. Whether it was Mozart or Beethoven or yeah. whoever we were listening to, what what uh-huh. what, what symphony? I, I knew all of that shit. Yeah, at the yeah, time. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Um, so, um, so, 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 yeah. So, so, it was kind of um, um, from an early age. It was kind of uh, it was there. It was there, yeah, and uh, and then uh, you know, I guess starting in fifth grade, I, I wanted to ask to. to like take clarinet lessons. Uh, I, I I was a Benny Goodman fan at an early age, oh. and uh, and then a couple of years later, I uh, I added sax as well and started started playing sax. Right. Um, and was and uh, I I I always like to tell the story that because it, it, it's a true story. The thing that probably first got me geared to wanting to do this. Uh, sort of full time I was uh in seventh grade and uh I was at my first school dance and it was like one of those classic things where like the boys were all lined up on one side of the gym then there was this great chasm and the girls are on the other and you're like sort of standing there going like well gee what if I ask her to dance and like she laughs at me or something sure and meanwhile there was like a band on stage and they were like they were like looked like they were having the greatest time, and I distinctly recall going like, "I'd way rather be up there than down here." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> so that's what uh, initially started me. Uh, first band I was in, you know, I was thirteen years old. Um, our criteria f- criterion for picking a drummer was he had to be able to play the the, the drum solo and write out. Yeah, sure. Why? But that was the uh, yeah, that was the test, right? The uh, litmus paper that was the test. test. Yeah, right. Yep. You yep. know, can the can the can the drummer play play yeah. the drum thing on yep. wipeout? Yep, yep, yep. I know. I know. In class, we'd all be playing it on our desks with our right. pencils. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then um, you know, then I just you know, through high school and then all through college, I played in different bands, and that's sort of what I how how I would make my money and stuff. Um, and uh, actually, I, I went to Columbia, and I was mm-hmm. uh, uh, like an American history major. And I was, you know, I was always playing in bands. But I, you know, the, 
for a long time I thought, well, I'm going to end up being a lawyer or, or, sure. or a history prof. By the time I graduated, I was like, you know, I don't want to go to graduate school. I don't want to go to law school. Right. I like being a musician. I like yeah. playing the sax. That's what I want to do. Let, let me ask you a question. So, let me just back up one second. I'm going to take. Sure. I know we're going to leave off. Now, as a kid, how were you in sports? And, uh, I, and I'll tell you why. I'm not. I'm not um, looking for trouble, but I'll tell you why in a second. No, not at all. Well, I, I in high school I was on the soccer team. Oh, okay. Um, and you know, I mean, I. I uh, there actually weren't that many kids in my. There were kids in my neighborhood who I obviously I used to yeah. run out. Well, well let know, me let me let me tell you what I'm getting. At. Let me tell you about my, me yeah. real quick. I'm I'm a keyboard player and I play clarinet and you know a couple of other instruments. And sure. I, and I, they would pick my grandmother to, to do to play baseball before they would pick me. <laughs> <laughs> I was so bad at sports that I had nothing to do but go home and play my piano. And that's how I got my. I, I and that's how I got. That. Yeah, and that's how I got my chops. I could. I couldn't play ball. I couldn't play football, baseball. You name the sport, and I sucked at it. So. Um, well, I had my share of like you know like you know, okay, Arno, you can play right field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was that kind of thing. But me, my grandmother would get the spot before me, and and, um, <laughs> right. and, and so you know I I kind of um, dived into keyboards and music. That's how I got involved. And, sure. uh, you know, I'm very good friends with a Michael Shreve, you know, the drummer from Santana and, you know, whatever. That yes, whole. actually, his his uh, younger brother, Kevin, uh, lived on, on the floor in my dorm when I went to Columbia. Oh, yeah, Kevin? Kevin, yeah. Yeah, sure, Kevin. Yeah, no, Kevin. Um, so, you know, I spoke to Michael yesterday and, you know, Lee Oscar, the harmonica player. Yeah. Yeah, Lee spent a lot of time with Michael as kids. And um, uh, Lee was telling me, and, you know, this is um, – I, I spoke to Michael about this just yesterday. Lee would say to me that um, – you know, Lee told me that he would – never practiced. You know, he, he said I would be out playing ball and this and that. And um, Mr. Shreve, Michael's dad, would start yelling, Michael, get away from the drums already. Get out there and play some ball. And, <laughs> <laughs> and Michael would just sit there and, you know, and practice, you know, his drums. And um, – you know, it's funny. A, a lot of uh, musicians just really had no, um, you know, just no interest in, in, in being a sports player. You know, it was one or the other, I guess. As a rule, yeah. as a rule. I mean, yeah. you know, part of the thing was that on my uh, my block, there weren't that many kids, so there weren't enough kids to sure. really get a good game of, of of football or baseball going. So, like, you know, I played and I enjoyed playing, but you know, there weren't yeah. uh, that. It wasn't like some of the neighborhoods where where they had enough for two teams, uh -huh. you know. They, oh, we we we, we we had enough for seven eight teams, you know. But it was just they never wanted me. <laughs> <laughs> so so I kind of became a musician and a lover. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. So you know you know, but that's how I kind of got um, you know my chops. I, I nobody wanted to play ball with me, so I learned you know I kind of. Got better at keyboards. So you played with everybody. You've worked with, you know, uh, you know. You're still doing your Dion thing, and um, still doing Dion. You know, when, yeah, when but 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 let me let me do a quick rundown. You, you some of your highlights. Tom Waits. You were in Rain Dogs. Tom Waits. You yes. worked with the Rolling Stones uh, live and in the studio. Yeah, and the Steel tour. Wheels. Tour. Yep, you guys did Steel Wheels. And I was I was uh, managing part of the Meadowlands when you guys came in on that Still Wheels tour. That was so, oh really? Yeah, yeah. I was managing, um, you know, as part of the management team at the Meadowlands, and um, you guys were just hot. I think the Foo Fight is open for you guys then. Oh, that no, that actually the Meadowlands. We played um, when we played this uh, this area. We did six nights at Chase Stadium. Right. Meadowlands would have been one of the later tours. We okay. were on the Steel Wheels tour. Oh yeah, this was the Voodoo Lounge. My mistake. I did see you guys yeah. at, the, at the stadium. Yeah, Voodoo Lounge was at the um, Meadowlands. But okay, so you did the Stones. You did. Let's see. Let's go back. Uh, Waits, the Stones, Jay Giles. You did a lot of tours with the Giles Band. Did a lot of stuff with the Giles Band and yep. did their last album, which was a live album, the, yep. the yep. Showtime album. Yeah, the Showtime album. Uh, you did one of the greatest James Brown later era albums, Gravity. Uh, my buddy, Gravity with, my, with yep. Living in America. On yep, it. yep. My good buddy, um, who you know wrote that tune. 
Um, let's see. Well, Dan Hartman and Charlie Midnight wrote all yeah, the yeah, songs. Charlie, yeah, yeah, Charlie. Yeah, Charlie. Yeah, I'm very friendly with Charlie. Have you read his book? I haven't read his book yet, but okay. uh, yeah, I love him. Good. I mean, you're out, you're out, uh, you're out west, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm in, Charlie, I'm in New Mexico. Uh, yeah, Charlie, Charlie is wonderful. Yeah, he's a great, great, great guy. He's wrote a great book. And um, let's see, you work with Cameo. Uh, I'll tell you a funny story. Well, it's not funny, but it's a story. Um, when I was working with Michael Shreve back in the uh, early 80s, our management team was Cameo's management team, um, Sandy, huh. Sanford Ross Management. They were, uh, Cameo was on there. Bill and, and you remember the great Eric Gale, the guitar player? Of course. Yeah, he course. was he was one of uh, the uh, guys on that team too. Uh, B fifty twos, Love Shack, the Cosmic Thing album. B fifty twos, Love Shack. We we did a tour with Robert Plant as the yep. Honey Trippers. Yep, 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 yep. You worked on yeah. Joan Jett's uh, um, uh, Up Your Alley album. Actually, we're on like eight or nine Joan Jett albums. Yep, yep, yep. But you get long could, association platinum on that one. Yeah. Okay. Albert Collins, who also did vocals on um, uh, on the um, Uptown Horns, uh, not album. just vocals. Uh, he no, yeah, he played too. Yeah, 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 yeah. But he did vocals, which is uh, in fact. Uh, I'll tell you very quickly. Great start. The the first cut on the album is we. There were two songs, uh-huh. and you know we wrote them specifically with Albert in mind. Right. Uh, the first one is uh, the song "Sugar Melts When It's Wet," right. which is you know like like you know your basic blues sure. shuffle. Sure. And um, Albert, you know, came to the studio and gave it, you know, obviously he did the vocals separate from, from when he did the guitar. But he, in terms of his uh, uh, guitar solo and playing and stuff, he, he, he gave it one listen. He said, Go, just start the machine. And he nailed that in one take. Really? That was like, that was like one first take and wow. just, you know. You know, it's like, okay, next. <laughs> yeah, well, I remember as a kid when I first heard Albert Collins, it was inc- just an incredible player. and, and um, Oh, amazing. Yeah, he was just amazing. What was it, um, 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 the Iceman? Um, Iceman, yeah, yeah. Well, a master of the Telecaster, that was his. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Incredible, incredible player. And um, you even got to work with uh, Iggy Pop. Icky Pop, yes, I'm very proud of this. That was um, our first credit as the Uptown Horns. Yes, it was on Icky Pop's Party album. Yeah, the Party album. Yep. And, and uh, how was Ziggy to work with? I mean, he's he's really mellowed over the years. Yeah, uh, he he was he was a tad on the wilder side at, at the time, but yeah. we uh, we we got along great with him. I mean, we did we did. Uh, a few live dates with him after right. we did the album and stuff, but he was, he was, he was a lot of fun. They actually I have an interesting story, and if you go to my, my site, uh, either my, my website yes. or or my my pro page on Facebook. And you're you um, let, let me chime in. Arno Hecht, Arnohecht H E C H T Arnohectmusic dot com is the website, guys. If you're listening out yes. there, yes, yep. Um, you can catch this cut. There was, um, so we had like recorded these other songs, you know, for the album. And then now mind you, this is like, you know, four thirty in the morning or something like that. And he was doing, he had his own version of, um, one for my baby, you know, yes. four in the mo- yep. one for my baby, one for the road. And, and he said, I want you to just go out and like, you know, just blow throughout the song behind my behind my vocal, right. and um, and I was like, you know, okay, uh, what what key? Because hey, you'll you'll figure it out when you when you hear it. <laughs> so so I was like, okay, um, you know, like let me you know give you know run it. Let me give it a listen. You know, I'll I'll just sort of like fool around and and see. So so we played. You know, and I, I hadn't, I didn't get to like, you know, I, I said like, you know, can I listen first? He said, no, nah, you know, go out, just mess around, and like you'll, you'll listen. As... So I did, you know. So, so I play it, you know, without having heard the song, you know, like I heard it starts. I figure out what the key is, and I just sort of like, you know, played whatever behind sure. the, behind the thing. So then it was done. I said, okay, I, I, I think I got it. Let's, let's run it. He goes, that was the take. 
<laughs> that was and I was like, no, 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 that wasn't the take. I was just, he goes, that's the take I want. It's my album. Well, so what was I going to do? I couldn't argue, you know, especially, yeah, sure. you know, like. Yeah, they're not with Iggy. I, I, right, I couldn't argue, you know. So um, I wasn't, I wasn't just at the notion. I wasn't thrilled about that. Right. And, and I was, I was actually fairly happy that. The cut didn't make it to the album. Yeah, it's out now. Then, it, it, it's out on some, uh, um, um, comp, you know, unreleased rare stuff. It's all over, you know. Well, it what it there. was when 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 they released it on on CD, uh-huh. it ended up being like a bonus. Yeah, bonus track. track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 then I listened, you know. So all these years later, I listened to it. and I was like, ah, it wasn't that bad. It was you no, know, <laughs> it's great. I mean, you know, it's Iggy. You know, you know what to expect when you listen to an Iggy Pop album. Um, well, that, it, I, no problem with Iggy's uh-huh. performance, you know, but yeah, I was yeah. worried about my own performance. I know, I know, but I'm just it's saying, you know, enough. anything goes with Iggy Pop. It's great. But um, uh, some of your other highlights. Um, well, let's go back. How, how was it working with Tom Waits? Uh, uh, Rain Dogs, I believe Chris Spenning did that album, too. Uh, was on that album? Uh, a whole bunch of people. Yeah, I, think I spoke Chris to Chris. Spenning and- Keith, Keith Richards. Yeah, Keith was on, but you know, uh, I, I interviewed Chris Spedding a handful of times, and Chris told yeah, me. Yeah, Gene Smith was on it. Mark Rebo was yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah, Mark was on um, it. Actually, what was, what was, uh, that it was quite a summer. We, we had, we were on the, the road with, um, with Tom, yeah. Uh, with, uh, Robert Plant. Uh-huh. It yeah, was like the summer 85, and we got the call to, to play on Tom's album. Uh huh. So, um, we had a, a couple of days off, uh, between Toronto and Buffalo. Right. So we flew down to New York to, to play on the album. We, we came walking in and we'd been on the road for a while and, you know, you get kind of fried on the road. Sure. And he just took one look at us. He goes, Oh, I can tell you boys been on the road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, he, he was a funny guy. I was, um, working out of a, a booking agency in uh, Minneapolis, and uh, he was on our roster. And every date we got him, he turned down. He, he just didn't want to do them. It was like, I said, yeah. and I said to him, what are we doing this for if you're not going to take the gigs? I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to do them. And he just did, he, yeah. he sat him out. But what, what a talent. Um, you yes, were, Major. Yeah. And what happened, so we did that. So we played on two songs. Well, one of the songs was this sort of like instrumental. Uh-huh. There was a, a bit of... Um, I don't know what it like a bit of like a detective theme, you know, yeah. spy movie theme Peter, sort of make you know, one of those yeah. type things. So we 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 laid down, you know, we figured out it was like you know it was all head charts, you know, sure. nothing, you know. So we we figured out where we played, and we laid down our tracks, and then uh, and then Tom said to me, he goes, "I want you to give me a solo, no notes, just sounds, just sounds, wow, just sounds." So I ended up doing this kind of like free jazz thing, you know, like, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. you know, like, like Coltrane period, like uh-huh. home and Kulu say mama. And atmosphere. Stuff. Yeah. Atmosphere. And, uh, and it actually came out pretty cool. Um, yeah. And the funny, the funny thing is, you know, we, as you know, you know, like we've, we've played on all these different albums sure. and worked with all these things. I can't tell you how many times, like I'd meet somebody, you know, like, and, and they'd say, oh, Uptown Horns. And I figured they'd say James Brown or whatever. Right. they go, like, you played on the Rain Dark South. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, um, yeah. yeah. Midtown, which is the song I'm tell- I was just describing. You go, right. I, I loop that. I, I listen to it over and over yeah. and over again. Rain Dogs, is, <laughs> Rain Dogs, I think, is his pivotal, his pivotal album where he kind of, you know, changed from um, like that barsy, you know, from the bar type vocal jazzy thing he had going. To um, yeah. just you know, boom that advent, that whole esoteric that was that was his thing. that was his like sergeant like yes. equivalent yes. of sergeant yes Pepper's. yes that's yeah um, that's, and he, he did he did I mean it's amazing how cool it, I mean he has this one song on there I mean it's, it's the, we're just on a couple of cuts sure but I mean the whole album is just uh, a real masterpiece yes it is and, he, and for example he has this song. I'm pretty sure Gun Street Girl, uh-huh. and the whole instrumentation consists of Tom strumming on a banjo, upright bass, and somebody 
hitting a hammer on an anvil. Wow. That's the whole instrument. And it's perfect. Yes. It's it's exactly right for that song. Did you ever hear him do um, that Disney tune um, from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs? Uh, well, you know. Yes. In fact, we played with him on that. Yes. Yeah that's, uh, yeah, that's right. You did. That's right. Now that I think about it. And that's the same thing with the anvil. Uh huh. And yeah. Well, that that album was was uh, it's it called Stay Awake. Yeah, the, the Disney. And, uh, yeah, yep, yep. Bob Dylan was on. It was it a and, project yeah, yeah. by the the late and truly great Hal Wellner. That's right. Who unfortunately, uh-huh. was an early COVID yes. victim yes, he was. that I would know about. And um, he had all these different people yep. uh, playing on the album, and and it was the most eclectic, but. And, I mean, like Los Lobos did uh, I Want to Be Like yeah, You. Yes, Sun Ra did. Uh, and, uh, and James Taylor did Second Star for the Right with Bob, Brentford Marsalis doing Bob, his solo. Bob Dylan did uh, um, 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 This Not Old Dylan, Man. This I, Old Man, right? Bob Dylan? No, Bob Dylan didn't didn't play out. But, I mean, like he had uh, Sun Ra did Pink Elephants. Yeah, yeah, right. Sun Ra did Pink Elephants. And, and uh, we got to, we played on um, Bonnie Rayet. Doing uh-huh. the song from Dumbo, Baby Mine, right, which was which was wonderful, and then we got to not only play but arrange uh, Buster Poindexter, right, doing uh, a song Spain, from Spain, Castles in Spain, right? Castle in Spain, yeah, yes. Castles in Spain, yeah. which was sort of like Eddie Palmieri on acid, yes, like yes, 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 what yes, we yes. came up with. And the coolest thing, I'm just going to say, what because I, I I'm very proud of that album in general and love it. They very appropriately. He had Ringo Starr mm-hmm. sing When You Wish Upon a Star. Right. And, and the album was on A&M Records. So on When You Wish Upon a Star, uh, they had Herb Albert do a trumpet solo. And as far as I'm concerned, it's worth the price alone just to hear Ringo go, take it, Herb. Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, I have the album. I thought, I thought Tom, I, I thought Bob Dylan did um, This Old Man. No, not on not on that album. No, no. wasn't that album. Okay. But um, okay, but it's uh, it's it it was a great a great album. Yeah, it was. Sure. Um, Sonra was great doing Pink Elephants. Yes, yes. I mean, perfect. You know. Uh, yeah, it was well. And but uh, the Waits piece. If you were a kid, that thing would have kept you up for weeks. Listening. Yes, to the, because it it it, it was like. Hi ho! Yeah, hi ho! It, it sounds. It, it, it sounds like <laughs> oppressed miners. Yes, like you know, like yeah. talking, like like it could have been from the soundtrack to Metropolis. Right, you know? right, 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 right. It was just you know, and 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 you keep hearing those ding 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 the bells in the back. It was uh-huh. quite haunting. Um, yeah, so um, great, great album. That's right. I forgot you guys played on that. Wow. Um. So. Um. You did the way you think. Oh, Billy Joel. You work with Billy. Billy Joel, the River of Dreams album. Yes, my buddy, um, 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 Pete Hewlett, did background vocals. He was still working with uh, oh, cool. Billy at the time on that album, I believe. He was. He did that one. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's, like, really nobody you guys haven't touched. Let me, just, um, let, let me just get back to this one second. I just kind of lost it. Here we are. And there you are. Um... Okay, so you 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 uh, we got to the you got to the B fifty two Buster the hot hot hot, right? Well, you know, again, it kind of an interesting you know that this little stories for for all these people when we um, first got started yeah. uh, in our current configuration as the Uptown Horns, we used to do a weekly Tuesday jam. At the original Tramps, on, I, sp- I, sp- on, I spoke to Elliot Murphy about that the other day, uh, a couple of months ago, actually. But this point, yeah, yep, on, on East Fifteenth Street between Third yep. Avenue and Irving Place. Yep, this first place I ever and, saw uh, you guys, and it was uh, it was quite an event. You know, we 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 do. Uh, I mean, our, our original lineup we had Mark Rebo on guitar, and Charlie Giordano is now part of. Uh, 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 Bruce Springsteen's band, you know, right. he was our keyboard player. Um, and, and we would, you know, we, we had the most amazing 
people would come by, you know, with the, uh, the Neville brothers were in town working on an album and they all came down and sat in. And, uh, one time we had, uh, Iggy Pop, Southside Johnny, David Johansson, and, uh, Mitch Ryder all on stage together singing Good Golly Miss Molly. Wow. Um, and, uh, David at the time was, uh, it was, it was post New York Dolls. And he was uh, touring under his own name, you know, just under David Johansson. Sure. And so he'd he'd be off the road, and he'd he'd sort of like you know wander into the club. It was he liked that place, like he used to like to hang there. Uh-huh. So he'd you know come in at two thirty in the morning, and he wanted to he he was into doing stuff that was different from what. What he usually, you know, from his rock and roll stuff. Right. So we do, you know, Mac the knife and give me a pig foot and a bottle of beer and, and uh, things like that. And, uh, that sort of started this process of him deciding like he wanted to come up with this alternate persona. Right. And, and do all that kind of material. So that's how the Buster. Poindexter thing literally evolved from that. And it's really, really, I don't know if it's ironic or what, but it was so much bigger than the dolls. And, oh, it became like a really, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, a really big thing. And, yep. and, you know, a hot, hot, hot ended yep. up becoming a, classic. a standard. A standard every yeah. every bar mitzvah you go to. Yes. <laughs> every For bar the mitzvah. longest time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still out there. Um, so, um I mean, let's just keep going. Your 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 resume is just incredible. You, um, I believe, I saw you guys work with um, the Allman Brothers once or twice. Played with the Allman Brothers at the Beacon. Yeah, at the Beacon. Yep. Yeah. In fact, if you go to my um, if you go to my Facebook pro page, uh-huh. it, it comes. Out. I mean, it's on my regular timeline also. But sure. A great version of Southbound. Yep, ArnoHeckMusic.com, guys. Get get your butts yeah. over there. Take a look at it. No, not just music. Dot, not Arno, ArnoHeckMusic.com. That's my my website. Right. But I have a, a Facebook pro page, you right, know, right. under yep. Arno Heck. That's yep. different from my regular yeah. timeline thing. But I want everybody to visit that the website. Um, uh, oh, thanks. Just, yeah, we get, you know, there's a whole yeah. bunch of videos. Of, so, yeah, there is some great stuff. I, I, I kind of went down the rabbit hole on it yesterday. Killed. Oh, cool. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, Ray Charles is, uh, you know, the Muppet Show with Buster. Yeah, yeah just incredible, incredible stuff. Some great Dion stuff there, Run Around Sue. You have the great version of it yeah. on the website. Yeah. But um, you've done a lot of work with uh, Peter Wolf and the, and the Giles Band, and the Jay Giles. Yes. And you you worked on Peter's um, you, you Can't Get Started. You, you, you guys worked on that. And you were the go-to horn players for um, – you know, for that for that whole Jay Giles thing. Yeah, well, we did. You know, we um, it was uh, like after about a year and a half of our 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 residency at Tramps, uh-huh. um, the Giles band was just coming off the road after opening for the Stones on right. their on their European leg uh-huh. at the time, and um, they were doing a tour and culminating in a live album the right. showtime album uh-huh. and they wanted horns for it so um so they they somehow they heard of us and uh okay uh seth and i think peter came down to tramps right and checked us out and next thing we knew we were working with them which was like you know they were coming off the freeze frame album which was Huge. of course like yeah. like this humongous uh yep hit album for them yep and if and, um, and, and I'm just going to add something. You guys brought them back to reality. They started getting into oh. very, they started getting into this whole popsy kind of world that Jay Giles didn't belong in, and um, <laughs> you, you guys gave him back that bluesy rock and roll feel. You know. Oh well, thanks. I don't know. I don't know how much of it was just them wanting to do it, but we were certainly a part of it. Yeah, and happy to be a part of it. Yeah, you were a part of it. Take your uh, bows. To, you know, you definitely. And, oh, uh, thank you. And of course, we did. Uh, so we were we were on the first single off that album, which was uh, "I Do." Yep. And then uh, the second single can't get started. Was, uh, no, can't get started. Was uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's uh, Peter Wolf. It's Peter Wolf. Peter Wolf's uh, yeah. solo album. Yes, but we the. 
the uh, the second single was uh, Land of a Thousand Dances, right. um, which at the time was uh, talk about a really big deal for for us and for me um, in 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 the show, and it ended up being on the album, which was you can imagine with uh, we had only been together for a couple of years at this point. He the they break in, at one point they break into a van. And P- and and Peter goes like uptown Hans, let me hear you and we start yeah. playing this 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 line and stuff and they go Arno Arno come on down and he had me like come down center stage and and go yeah. Arno make him dance and, and, <laughs> and, 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 I played, and I played this all and I was thrilled that it ended up like being on the I mean you can yeah, imagine you know sure. it ended up being on the album um, especially yeah I mean I mean that was so many you know so many albums ago. Yeah, yep, and then yep, yep. you know uh, the can't get started story with that one too. Um, we were we had been we had played on a, a, a Rodney Crowell album, uh-huh. and we we were uh, we were doing sort of a bit of touring with with Rodney and had been out on the West Coast, um, and and. Uh, we were heading back and I, I think I, you know, there was a stopover somewhere like Atlanta or Chicago or something. And, uh, I called home and checked my messages and, uh, and Pete, it was Peter saying, you know, are you, are you available to do this thing? So I called him. He was, uh, in, in, uh, I'm trying to remember the, the, the hit factory in, okay. in New York. Yeah. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, I'm, just flying in from LA and he said, Oh, when you get, when, you know, we're, we're here all night. So like, you know, call me when you, when you, when you land. So two in the morning, you know, I, I, uh, basically like headed over to, from, from Newark airport to the hit factory right. and walked in and basically can't get started. I did that like on, uh, it was like a first take at, wow. at, like in the wee hours of the morning and stuff. Um, and what I'm still very proud of. Yeah, great, 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 great tune. Now, if I'm if I'm not uh, mistaken, Jay Giles and the Rolling Stones had the same management at the time, right? No, but um, Peter Peter did. No, no, it was, it was uh, Jeb Hart and Bob Hinkle. Uh huh. Who's oh, maybe it was and, the same uh, attorneys? I know they were hooked up somehow. Same, um, definitely the same accounting firm. Maybe it was the accounting firm. Okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah, uh, Joe Raskoff, who's, yeah, who's since parted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, um, uh, um, yeah, I actually did. A, I had a, a gig doing something else for like a week. I got out of the music business for a week, and I remember running into. Uh, they were hooked up somehow, but anyway, um, let's get back to Al Cooper. Al Cooper, yes. Another boy from Queens, by the way. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, he actually uh, he, went to... We, we're going to tell you a great story about Al. You know, I used to manage in my father's place in Roslyn. Sure. Okay. I it was to, one of my haunts back in the day. Yes, yeah, everybody's. Um, you know, I used to work with Epi. And um, um, anyway, uh, I uh, as a kid, I went to... I loved the first Jay Giles album. The first album was sure. Killer. Uh, Serves You Right to Suffer. I mean, like, that was like, you know, Wow. Um, anyway, of they were opening for Al Cooper at CW Post at the college. Wow. And I went to see them, and um, Cooper opens the show, and Jay Giles gets the headline. And it was supposed to be opposite. Wow. Anyway, years later at my father's place, I run into Al Cooper. And I said to him, hey, years ago I saw you guys play at um, Post with Jay Giles. And you were supposed to be the headliner, but you opened the show. And you let them close. What happened? He said he had death threats, and his mother and father were in the audience, and um, he was still getting death threats, death threats from the Bob Dylan thing, the whole going electric thing. Really? Yes. Yeah, no so he, he said, I wanted to get my parents out of there in case, uh, you know, the shit hit the fan. And so he opened <laughs> the show and ran. <laughs> it was like, you know... But yeah, that was um, that was years after that too. I mean, that had to be what seven, maybe nineteen seventy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah wow. Yeah. He was still getting death. He was getting death threats. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He said he was getting death threats. Wow. And I, I had to leave this. You know, I just wanted to get my parents out of there, so we we ran. Um, but yeah. So 
That was the first time I saw Jay Giles, and man, they were hot. They were like really, really great oh. back in those days. They were like one of, I mean, to this day, still one of the great bands. Yeah. And and I mean, Peter and Peter Wolf is is absolutely one of the, one of the best frontmen. You've worked with the best. Fr- you've worked with the best frontmen. You worked with Joe Cocker. You worked with, worked with Joe Cocker, uh, Buster. Yeah. You know, uh, um, you did the Buster thing. Uh, sure. I mean, you work with some of the greatest, you know, um, incredible. So, um, yeah, John Jett, and Pat Benatar. Yeah, you know. yeah, you work with the with the best fronts. But anyway, um, Dion, you're still working with one of the best. Um, but yes, yeah. Um, let's go back to Al Cooper. Al's, um, he's a master. He's an incredible, sure. incredible artist. He's in Nashville now. Uh, no, 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 no. He's, he's, te- he, yeah, he's teaching in Boston now. My mistake. And, yeah, uh, Berkeley. Yeah, he's up in Berkeley, and um, yeah, he was in the uh, Nashville for a bit. That's right. He's teaching again. Back. He was. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and he has that a uh, uh, band now. The um, uh, uh, what's it called? The the, the um, not the alumni, whatever. The faculty. Yeah, I know. I know it. The, yeah, the faculty. The faculty. Yeah, yeah. The faculty. And um, great band, but uh, you did the uh, great album, Recuperation. We did Recuperation, and we also did the li- his live retrospective, yeah. which was yep, yep. a great experience. He he had he had like a, a blues project reunion, yep, and a blood, yep. sweat, and tears yep, reunion. Yep, and, yep, yep. Uh, People don't realize what great music he's put out over the years. Oh yeah, um, uh, this Diamond Ring is his tune. You know, he co-wrote that tune. This Diamond Ring, right? He wrote that. Yeah. He, I mean, he's not all, he he was the guy who played uh, French horn at the beginning of "You Can't Always Get What You Want." Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Also, he was in uh, wedding bar mitzvah bands with um, Paul Simon. I, I see. I didn't know that, but yeah. I I mean, I knew a bunch of you know. I mean, we've yeah. we've had a lot of moments sort of yeah. sitting and schmoozing. And, yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, him, yeah. Him and Paul were in uh, bar mitzvah bands together. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine those two guys playing at your bar mitzvah? I could imagine what, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, incredible. Just like in, history is incredible. Music history is incredible. Um, yeah. So, I, so you did, you know, all that stuff. You you work with Keith Richards on his solo work. Which, That's uh, right, the main offender. Album. Which is a great album. It's an incredible album. Yeah. You know, at at the time, um, you know, when everybody thought the Rolling Stones were gone, he was, you know. He, he still held the torch. He was still a Rolling Stone, so to speak. He still had it, you know. Um, Very much. You know what? I, I, it's, and and I'm not like you know blown smoke here. Like you know, um, he's the Rolling Stone. I Stones. rarely use, I rarely use the the term genius to describe somebody. I mean, there's right. a, a very small. List, short list of people who who I would use that term for. Keith is one of those. Keith has the most amazing sense of like, like this is right for the Rolling Stones. Yep. This is right for my solo thing. Yep. This, I mean, when um, I'll tell you a couple of quick stories. First one, you know, when he when he uh, was was nice enough to guest on our album. Yeah, I mean, he came down. He brought a couple of guitars. He had listened to the song. And it was like, you know, I mean, Keith Richards is a side man. You know, it's like, well, you know, I was thinking of this for this part. What do you think of this sound? And how about this idea? It was like, yeah, great. <laughs> yep. Um, but uh, I'll I'll tell you, in a, one of the one of those like epiphanies that I had, we were rehearsing for the European leg of the Steel Wheels or uh-huh. Jungle Tour, and um, I can't even tell you what song it was, but. We ran through, we rehearsed the song, you know, it's like the four of us with Bobby Keys and right. Chuck Lavelle was on keyboards and, and, um, and, uh, at the end of the song, you know, it, it was really, really tight and, you know, sound, sounded great. And everybody, you know, at the end of it had this look on the, like, you know, like, yeah, you know, we got that one down. And Keith goes into this whole thing. Goes, no, no, no! It's all wrong. He goes, it's, it's, it's the Rolling Stones. He goes, like, and 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 he went into this spiel about like, you know, like 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 think of it like it's 
it's like the last song of the night, and it's four in the morning, <laughs> and like, like, and and you've had like too much to drink, yeah. and like, and stuff. So we we played the song again, and everybody kind of on purpose kind of played like like a little messed up, yeah, a little sloppy, and and the song had this this feel of like on the verge of falling apart without ever falling apart. Right. And at the end of it, it suddenly hit me, that's their sound. Yeah. I had always thought they sound the way they sound because that's how they play and that's their sound. It suddenly like it it suddenly like dawned on me that no, this is intent this is on purpose. And this is this guy's vision of what they're supposed to sound like. Yeah. Like they don't have to sound like that. It's like he him sitting there going, This is what we're supposed to sound like. Yeah, and he's right. And, you know, that's how him and Charlie used to play. They were like a, a, a millisecond off. Yes. And, and they always sounded like they were about to trip and fall and just you know and lose they it. Never all. Did. And they never did. And that like I said, it and it was just like this it this this moment of revelation just sort of like Holy shit! Like this is, this is like you know this, yep. this is this on is, purpose, you yes, know, and, yep. and, and this is his idea of like how they're supposed to sound. Yep. And and obviously it's a very successful. Formula. Yeah, it always worked for them, and I think um, as the, as they progressed, you know, as, as they got um, older and, and they kept putting in albums, they started losing that edge. Yeah. They started sounding a little more polished, and I think that's kind of what, um, you know, maybe it's the you know, maturity, whatever it is, but, yeah, they did lose that edge. And, you know, man, they yeah, the Stones were the Stones. And, but that was the whole thing with Charlie Watts and Keith. They were, like, always a, a millisecond off, and they, always, right. and they always sounded like it was going to implode, that it was just never going to happen, but it always happened. Yeah. Well, yeah. So wow, that's an incredible story. But yeah, they, uh, man, what a band. Um, what a band. Yeah. So you guys did a, you know, the, the big tour with them, um, and you, um, let's see, you, you, you spoke about Rocky Four, Living in America, which is a classic. I spoke to Charlie about that, Charlie Midnight, and he told yeah. me, were you there when um, Stevie Ray Vaughan came in? No, but I'll tell you. Actually, the sa- it was the same summer that yeah. uh, as as the Rain Dogs album. Uh-huh. It was that fruitful summer for us. We um, we were on tour with Robert Plant, uh-huh. and uh, I got a call from uh, Dan Hartman, right? Charles uh, Gardner. We had played on 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 his last m- most recent album at the time, and uh, and Dan called up and actually I was married at the time my wife said you know Dan Hartman called like you know give him a call and and he said I'm I'm uh, producing this uh this uh James song for James Brown that's going to be in the Rocky Four movie Mm -hmm. and and I want you guys to do the horns and I was like ah you know like for a horn player like you know James Brown is sort of like as, as good as it gets on a lot of levels sure and I was like man I would I would give my eye teeth to play on a on a James Brown album, but like, you know, we're on this tour with Robert Plant and we're out in L.A. right now. Right. And Dan said, "Well, I'm going to be in L.A. in a couple of days." Well. <laughs> and and so what happened was we had a um, uh, we had a a, a show in uh, in Phoenix, uh-huh. and then there were a couple of nights off in Phoenix, so we flew back to L.A. Actually, and and we ended up doing the that living in America. And actually, the next night we went and did a uh, a play on a Pat Benatar album. Really, uh, but but the 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 living in America was great because we went in and uh, and Dan uh, Dan said, well, it should evoke classic James Brown, but it should sound modern. Right. So we. You know, we came up with all these with the horn parts for that, and we throw in like little bits, little James systems. So at the beginning, like it goes Bob, wait up, and the wait up is the voicing for Cold Sweat. Okay, that the horns go in Cold Sweat. Sure. And then there's 
like between the first and second verse. There's this da 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 thing, and that's that's like a lick, and and the same chord voicing and stuff from Lick and Stick. Right. You know, so we so we kept you know throwing in little little classic James yep. little bits of like classic James Brown, but of course yep. you know the rest was yeah more modern stuff, and we. Uh, we we had a ball doing that, and, and, it, and at the end, you guys, at the end, he threw it on. I feel good. Yes. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, but and, um, and in fact, there's a there, there's a line he says at one point when there's like a stop, and he goes, because if you remember Eddie Murphy used to, yeah, do yeah, like, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, Eddie Murphy, you know, and, yeah, Eddie, yeah. Eddie stops and goes, Eddie Murphy, eat your heart out, eat your heart out. Yep, 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 yep. Well, you know, I I uh, I, I saw that tour, and um. Uh, at Radio City, I caught that uh, uh, "Living in America" tour, and he was yeah. you know, he was older then, and he was a little tired. But man, he that voice never left him. That voice never left him. That voice in fact, never left I'll, him. I'll, I'll tell you a funny story from that. So you know, now like you know, it it, it was actually either the biggest hit or the second biggest hit of his of his career. Yeah. Um, so now we're at work doing doing all the rest of the gra- the whole Gravity album. Yep. And, uh, at, at this point, you know, we were laying down like horn, horn parts to all the different songs. We hadn't met James yet. Right. So he specifically wanted, you know, wanted to come down. You know, chords were always kind of important to him. He wanted to meet the guys who were like doing the horn parts for his stuff. So he came to the studio and, um, and at the time, you know, like we had just done Robert Plant and stuff. We we looked uh, in, in terms of how we dressed and our general look was we were more rock. You know, he was expecting you know your your usual studio guys at the time, and sure. like we looked more rocked out than he was anticipating. Uh-huh. And so so uh, uh, you know we used to wear leather jackets and all that. Bit. So so uh, Dan Hartman goes, you know, like James Brown wants you to meet the Uptown Horns. And James turns to had his wife with him, and he turns to his wife and goes, "My music touches all kinds of people." <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, you know I saw him uh, later on after the Radio City run, and I was backstage. I forgot where the heck it was. It might have I don't know. It wasn't in New York, but anyway, he comes off stage right, and his first yeah. his first words are, "Say it loud. I'm black and I'm tired." <laughs> <laughs> And, and I have to say, you know, subsequently when we would, like, you know, see him or be on whatever with him and stuff, he was really nice to us. Yeah. I yeah. mean, he was very, he remembered us and he was very nice, you know. Yeah, was, but um, that was a great album. In fact, uh, Joni Mitchell copped the song from that album. Oh, I didn't even know that. Yeah, How yeah. Do You Stop? How Do You Stop? Yes, great song. Yeah, beautiful song. I think that's one. Of, I think that's one of James Brown's greatest albums. It was definitely his last greatest album, and um, you know he didn't really. Yeah, he, he and didn't, every song was 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 written by Dan Hartman and Charlie Midnight. Yeah, Midnight. Yeah, I, you know I, I speak to Charlie you know relatively often, and um, you know, he told by all me, means tell him I say hi. I, I will. Mean, you know, uh, yeah, we're, I will. We're sort of in touch through Facebook, but yeah, and but Steve, please tell him I say hi. I will. And Stevie Ray Vaughan came in. And he, they said he was so shocked. First of all, he took um, union, do you know, union pay, I believe. You know, right. He, he right. didn't. He didn't. Um, you know, he, he whatever he, he took whatever the, what was the payment was. But they said he would have stayed there for two days if they didn't tell him it's it's, it's good enough. You, you're not going to get anything better than this. He said the guy just came in and kept get. You know, he just, he wanted to hate it. He just wanted to make that thing so um, so his. And between you guys and Stevie Ray Vaughan, how, I mean, how can you miss? Oh well, thanks. Yeah, we were. Yeah, it was. We uh, were very honored and very excited to be playing on that. So. Yeah, yeah, and um, yeah, I mean, it's a classic. That, that, that's another one that's going to be around forever. So, you, I mean, you aren't sure. su- you aren't such iconic tunes out there that that are, are definitely going to be around when we're not. Um, you know, hot, hot, hot. Another classic, yeah. uh, "Living in America." Uh, um, Love Shack. This is stuff that's, you know, this is the stuff that's ingrained in music history. Yeah, well, we're fortunate to have done all that stuff. I'm very happy to have done it. Now, Love Shack, that's another one. You know, we, yeah. we, we played on that. 
And I remember walking as we left the studio and we're like, we're heading out. And I remember saying to the, to the other, the guys and, you know, my partners, yeah. it's going, you know, that's like a quirky song, but I could see that somehow like ending up being a hit. Yep. 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 I couldn't always call them, but I called it on that one. You got, did you guys happen to play on Fred's uh, solo album? On, on what? On, on, on Fred Schneider's solo album. No, we're not on the French night okay. of solo. Okay, yeah, um, yeah, because I, I mean, I mean, Love Shack. It was their last hurrah, too, right? That was their last big one, yeah. yeah. And that, yeah, that's and that's a couple of decades. So, um, you guys are definitely, you know, you, uh, you're a winning combination out there. So you're the guy who's did you did you start the horns, the uptown horns? That was your. Baby? I did. I. You know what it was? I had um, had an earlier uh, lineup. In, in the late 70s. Right. And uh, we were together for a couple of years. And, you know, we, you know, we were all, obviously, we we were all younger. Sure. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, and we hung in there for a couple of years and did, you know, sort of a mishmash of, of different gigs. Uh, we played around New York with John Paris, who's uh-huh. like a long, an old friend. I, I, you probably know who John is. Sure. And, and um and the built i c blues band, and we played on a cut on a Genya raven album uh-huh. um Genya's great, isn't she oh Gen- I love Genya. yeah she's, I, I spoke to Genya not too long ago she's incredible, yeah, she really is I'll tell you a funny story about Genya. she um I saw a ten wheel uh, a, a ten wheel drive back at the Fillmore in the day. Right, and she wore a uh, um a, a blouse, and when they turned on um you know, some of the light combinations, it was see-through. Right. And so she's standing there, you know, she looked nude from the top down, uh, you know, from the uh, right. waist up, I should say. And uh, when I spoke to her, um, I said to her, Genya, you, you were my, uh, I thought about, you know, you, you were my dream for like months when I was a kid. <laughs> you know, I guess she kept going back to the film <laughs> war. And she said, yeah, thanks. So we kind of fell in love with each other. And, you know, uh, she, she's incredible. But I'm sorry, continue your story before the Uptown Horns. Oh yeah, so so that was uh, the initial thing that you know, and I came up with the name Uptown Horns, uh-huh. um, originally because, well, sort of a long story, but we all met at this sort of uh, uh, jazz workshop, sort of finishing school for for professional musicians, run by this guy, uh, uh, Lynn Oliver, who was one of one of the great teachers of my life. Anyway, so we, we hung in for a couple of years, and then we drifted apart for different reasons. The, our bone player was a friend of mine going back to my college days, by uh-huh. a guy by the name of Paul Berman. And he was at this crossroads between being a professional writer and being a professional musician and opted for, for writing and, right. um, you know, ended up pretty successful as a writer. You know, he's... He was, you know, he's written, written books and, and, uh, uh, he, you know, written stuff for the New York Times and New Yorker and kinds of stuff. So he kind of, he went into writing and our trumpet player, Scott Black, uh, decided he wanted to give up trumpet and become an upright bass player. He was, he was like a hardcore jazz guy. Okay. Um, and he, he's out in Arizona running, running sort of a school, like, for, for young jazz musicians and doing and they win competitions they come to Lincoln Center and huh. but anyway so so we kind of split up and then um I was playing in a uh um with this uh this woman Brenda Bergman who had a a a, a band called Brenda and the Real Tones mm-hmm. uh that was sort of like you know on on, on the New York sort of yeah. Downtown scene, I guess you would say. Right. And um, I met Paul Litter- Paul Literal, and I met on a studio date, and and he was playing in uh, Best Little Whorehouse in Texas at the time, and um, and I got him, uh, and and Brenda needed a trumpet player, and I said like, hey, you know, you want to do this gig? And he was like, yeah, sure, and stuff. And Brenda had this very, like, not to she had. She had done like a couple of Tom Iron plays. She'd been in uh, in an Andy Warhol flick and done like 
been featured in Andy Warhol's interview and stuff. Right. And um, so she had uh, not only a large gay following, but like like more a more extreme gay following at the time. So you know, like like six foot five transvestites, like you know, in leather minis and stuff yeah. like that. And I remember when we first, uh, the first gig that Paul did, like he was like, I don't know, I don't know if this is my scene. <laughs> Um, but he, you know, he, he got into it, right? I mean, it was a, a great, Mark Rebo was the guitar player in the band. Right. Um, well. and, uh, and so we started working and then people, um, you know, we were working with different bands and we were like, started playing, um, with this, uh, uh, this young sort of, I don't know what you kind of like, kind of like soul punk band oh. called the Night Cats. Okay. And, uh, and, and so, so they, they started using us and I remember, and their manager said, well, you know, people kind of know, know you from like have from your bed, you know, when you called yourself the Uptown Horns, right. why don't you and Paul call yourself the Uptown Horns? And I'm like, well, sure. Why not? I came up with the name. Sure. And then next thing you know, like, you know, Crispin got involved and Bob Funk got involved. Right. And so, so the name stuck and then. It, thus it became the Uptown Horns, but that's how it all began. Now, um, we we talked about some of your major uh, um, work, but you have so much major work that we didn't even talk about that it would take uh, four more hours. You're on one of my you're on one of my iconic Graham Parker albums, Steady Nerves. Yes, yes, which is a brilliant I got to album. Play and, that, on that one. and that was '85. That was that that was you know another big piece. Um, yeah, uh, you know you, that's the year you did Rain Dogs. Locked Up in Green was the name of the song. Yeah, yeah, it's a great album. Um, yeah, you, l- let me just do a quick rundown. Um, Solomon Burke. Solomon Burke. Uh, yeah, the so story. Alive, I can yeah. Tell. yeah, Solomon. We, um, I saw Solomon at the. Um, I think they call it now uh, the Lightning in the Bottle concert at Radio City. That um, uh, it was a big blues thing, a big blues tribute night. Sure. And uh, yeah, that Solomon man, that stage was bouncing when he was bouncing. Oh, he was uh Solomon well, there's many stories I could tell about Solomon which I probably shouldn't repeat. But he um it's big man. Big man. He was he was absolutely one of the greatest vocalists yes. I ever got to play with. He was he was and amazing. We we did this uh uh, this live album with them, this solo live uh, album. Yep. And uh, solo live. Yes, solo live. And actually, talk about one of those. Uh, um, there, one of the cuts from that album, I think it was "Cry to Me," uh-huh. ended up on this special compilation album of 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 the American Black Experience that had. Not only, you know, music like, you know, Mahalia Jackson, but also, you know, like a speech by Malcolm X and right. a speech by, you know, Martin Luther King and this one and that one. And what's far out is that the credits are listed alphabetically. So, you know, like I'm one name away from Langston Hughes. <laughs> wow. Um, which was pretty cool. But yeah, yeah Solomon. Yeah. Was was one of the greatest. Yeah, of, he was. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just running through some names now because the Honey Drip, as we spoke about, Plant. Oh, uh, you even yeah. you even work with the Bronski Beat. Bronski Beat, yes, produced yeah. by um, by Mike Thorne. Yeah, and uh, great. And uh, in fact, uh, I mean, we played on "Tell Me Why," which was their big single. But then I got to play on um, "Do My Clarinet Thing" on their version of "Ain't Necessarily So." Uh huh. Which uh, again is one of those things I'm kind of proud of. Yeah. Um, um, well, incredible stuff. Uh, um, you worked with. Uh, you did a lot of work with, with Joan Jet. We we hit that real quick. But um, yeah. Um, what, let me ask you a question. Um, the Hall of Fame. I know you you guys are in the Blues Hall of Fame. We're in the, at least the New York Blues Hall of Fame. Yeah. Yes, yes. How come you guys haven't crossed over yet to the Rock Hall of Fame? Why are they letting people like uh, like Janet Jackson in and, and and people who really weren't really rock focused? You know, I I'm not even gonna like 
to our own. I mean, first of all, the Jake Gals band yeah. has been nominated if you're, and has never gotten it, right. which yeah. I think is kind of appalling. But this is one of my, while we're on this subject, one of my major pet peeves. Yeah. And, and I consider this a, a, a real outrage is Junior Walker. Uh -huh. Has never been posthumously inducted into the Hall of Fame. Yeah, and you know, I don't get that. I know. Not only is he a seminal influence on on R and B rock and roll sax playing, uh -huh. but the guy had like humongous hits. Yep. Roadrunner. Yep. What does it take? Yep. Shotgun. Yep. I don't know why he's not in the Hall of Fame. Yep. Um, you know who one of my good friends is? Um, um, um Jerry Jermont. Oh sure, I know Jerry. Yeah, not well, but I, yeah, yeah. I well, know J Jerry. Jerry was Jerry was in, in uh, Junior's band for all those years. Sure, and, and um, in fact, uh, you know, this is well. He was in King Curtis's band. I'm not sure he was in Junior's. Oh, band. I'm sorry, he was in King Curtis's band. But yeah, he did some work. Yeah. Um, and anyway, um, yeah, I mean, there's so many great guys who have never made it there yet. Yeah, um, I, I, um, it's just you know, but. You know, they, they're kind of letting in, and I'm not taking anything away. These are all talented people. You know, Whitney, yes, I agree. You know, you know Whitney Houston, uh, um, uh, even Aretha. The, you know, does she belong in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Does she do rock and roll? I, I don't know. It's it's like a fine line. But how come the horns didn't get in? You guys worked with every rock band out there. You guys, you know, Peter Wolf, uh, um, the Rolling Stones, uh, Joan Jett. You know, now uh, how come Joan Jett's in? But um, uh, you know, you know. Joan well, John, John belongs in there, and in fact, no, no, if you no, ever no, read no. her, no, she does belong there. Her, if you ever read her speech, she gave one of the great she speeches did. of all time. No, 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 she did. No, no, Joan belongs there, but how come they let Pat Benatar? How come they passed her by? You know, you got me. You know what I'm saying? And and I yes. and I don't really love Pat Benatar's music per se. You know, it's not my thing. But she did more rock and roll stuff than uh, uh, Janet Jackson did. Uh, you know, the, the notorious B.I.G. did. You know, that, that, that's sure. my pet peeve. And, and not, not, you know, Joan belongs there. Pat belongs there. You know, there's just so many people that they pass by and bring in people that aren't related to rock. Um, and, and it's not like there's not a, a, a place for these people. You know, there's an R&B Hall of Fame. There's this Hall of Fame. There's that. It, it just became a, a circus, I think. Um, well, I don't mind, you know, I, I don't mind anybody who said it, but like I said, I mean, you know, I mean, li listen, before before we should be in there, Junior Walker should be in yeah, there. Yeah, Junior should be in there, yeah. I, 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 I mean, like, I, I mean, every chance I get, I I feel compelled to, to speak up and say yep. something because I do not, do not understand no. how come Junior Walker's not in there. No, there's, there's, no. There's and, something... Very wrong with their whole setup. If 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 they're if he's I don't know you know yeah, yeah. go figure. Yeah, but I mean you've worked with everybody from uh, well you're still working with Dion, but um, you still know still working with Dion who's yeah, great. Yeah, but you know Randy and the Rainbows. Uh, you you hit like you know you did the Cocker stuff. You did uh, you know uh, the shirts. You know you, you kind of worked with everybody. Ronnie Spector. Um, yeah, you know, you know, you know. We spoke about Giles. We spoke about you know all these guys. You guys deserve a little nod too. You know the commit. You oh, guys, well, thank you. you. Like, you well, guys I even, won't argue with you. <laughs> yeah, and, and 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 I just kind of feel like it's um, it's it's not fair. Look at the you know Tommy James and the Shondells never made it. The Turtles never made it. Uh, you know, I don't think the MC Five are in there. I don't think the MC Five are in there. You know, I know. I think you're right. But how about the bands like um. I mean, there's so many great bands. I, we'll spend a month going through them, but um, you know, but R and B guys are in. It just doesn't make sense. It's just I don't know. But what are we going to do? We have to live with it, right? I mean, Eric Clapton got in three times. Blind Faith, which was a great band, and everything else. Do they deserve a sure. Hall of Fame nod? I don't think so. They did one album that was, you know. They did one album, right? Yeah, yeah. but you know, whatever. It, I guess it's to sell tickets. Um, anyway. So what's uh, what, what, what's the plans now? What are we doing for the rest of uh, the year in 2022? What are we doing for the rest of the year? Well, you know, there's a bunch of stuff. Um, I played on a couple of cuts for this uh, this British band, The Struts, uh -huh. who, are, who are really like a good, you know, 
Neil Deal rock and roll band, and uh, uh, they were recording out in L.A. and got in touch with me and had me lay down tracks for a couple of songs. So mm -hmm. um looking forward to that album coming out. Uh, uh, a little earlier, we the horns we played on um, uh, a cut for the script. Do you know who the Empty Hearts are? No. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Is that the guy from the car? Um Elliot Easton. Yeah, Elliot Easton. Uh, yeah, cars. Yeah, Wally yeah. Palmer yep, from yep, the yep. Romantics. Yeah, I do know who they are. Andy Buick from um, uh, Babiuk, I guess, from the Chesterfield Kings, and Clem yep. Burke, the yeah, drummer Clem. from Blondie. Yep, 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 yep. yep. Um, and we played on this song, uh, Well, Look at You. That's pretty cool. So we're mm -hmm. on that album. Um, uh, the, uh, you know da David Bennett Cohen? Sure. Yeah, I played on uh, some stuff for him. Uh, cool song you can you can YouTube it. It's a song called Hot Chocolate. You know, David has a great history too. Oh yeah, well you know, Country Joe and the Fish. Yeah, yep. <laughs> um, so uh, so I, I I played on uh, some stuff of his. Uh, there's this group in in New York who I'm friends with uh, called the Sins, as in C Y N Z. Yeah, you worked with them before, right? I played with them before, but this was the first time I played on their album. First time they had like any like corn, like a sax on their albums, uh -huh. and I played on a couple of cuts with them. You can, uh, it's their tenth. It was their tenth album. Yeah, and uh, you can also you can YouTube a song called "I'm Still Here," uh -huh. um, where uh, where I got to lay down some stuff, and they, you know they've been getting great reviews, and you know. Genya, Genya plays their stuff on her serious sure. uh, thing. And yeah, yeah, the XM. Different, different people, so played on that, you know. Um, so, you, so, so you're keeping one foot in the uh, younger market, and then you, the other foot is in the uh, classic legacy guys. In the classic legacy guys, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's all rock and roll to me. You know? Yeah. So, and, um, how, and, and so, how about the horns? You can do another album. Are we going to do another album of our own? I think um, it's time, man. It's time. Uh, you know, you ne you never can tell. You know, it was when we when we did that, we were coming off the Stone Store, so we obviously had some money in the bank. Yeah. And and we were, you know, we were sort of like, you know, for once, let's do the album that we want to make. Right. Great album. Um, it's a great album. Tell everybody about oh, that thank album. You. Um, and, you know, we went through the same crap that all kinds of people go through, you know, like, like, you know, I, you know, we, we gave it to a number of, of people and, you know, uh, you know, you get somebody coming back and saying, you know, I love this album and I listen to it all the time, but my label would never go for it. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, we went to, uh, to, like you know blues labels and like well if the album was all like albert collins we'd buy it in a second but you have this other stuff like this yeah. this song with peter wolf and keith richards that really doesn't fit our our format you know so um <laughs> well so we went we went through all that kind of stuff so now, now, now you, uh, yeah but, but i mean you guys are the uptown horns uh yeah you know you know like i said you know there's we, you never say never. But, right. uh, you guys worked on another one of my favorite albums, a Bill Laswell production. Uh, uh, Buddy Miles? Yes. Buddy Miles? Uh, oh, Buddy Miles, sure. Yeah, you know, I do a show Monday nights that um, um, Bill Laswell uh, uh, promoted. It's called a Destroy Irrational Thought Radio. Huh. And Bill is involved with the show with me. And I play a cut from Hell and Back, one cut or another, every Monday night. Oh, um, cool! Yeah, um, what an album that is! That is an incredible album. Is that the one? I, let me say, I played on a couple of his, but but let is let me be me on that that um, one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Please let me be me. Yeah, that was uh, loved, buddy. You know, it was. Uh, in fact, I, I post this usually a lot of times, like around his his birthday and stuff. Mm -hmm. There was a. Um, uh, Jimi Hendrix, uh, tribute concert at, yep. at, uh, uh, BB King's. Yeah. And, 
I, I forget who I was playing with there and stuff, but Buddy was there, and I hadn't seen him for a while. And, you know, we embraced, and it was like, you know, see, it was it was like seeing an old friend, you know, it, it, like that was the vibe and stuff. And he, uh, he was, he was, he was up. He got me up on stage to play with like him and Harvey Brooks on bass. And yeah, um, um, Har- Harvey's a great guy too. Oh, Harvey's fantastic. Yeah, and and uh, and and anyway, you know, and and it was uh, a great experience. And um, and he was got you know he was gone a few months later. Yeah. Um. Yeah, he had, he 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 was his own worst enemy, buddy. Uh, yeah, yeah I mean, oh, and Jose Feliciano. That's, oh wow, well. that's who don't the forget, other guy was. Yeah, don't forget him. Wow. Yeah, no. Oh. So it was it was great, you know. And, and I mean, thanks to Buddy, you know, I got the I got the play. That you know, but uh, you know, yeah. that was that was the last time I saw him. And then, yeah. like I said, like a few months later, he was gone. Yeah. Well. Wow. First time I saw Buddy play live, um, well, I saw the band The Gypsies at the, sure. at the Fillmore, but um, well, the, him leading his own thing. He opened up a show at Madison Square Garden for 10, uh, for ten years after. Wow. He was the opening act, and my God, what a powerful band he had. Oh, I mean, he was great. You know, listen, I was a... Uh, I mean, we got to play, like, a bunch of live stuff with him also, but... Yeah. He, um, I was, uh, in fact, it, it, the Electric Flag, uh-huh. a long time coming album. Yep. That was, that's st- that was one of my favorite, favorite, all time yep. favorite albums yep. back in the day. And in fact, it's still like in my top 10 favorite albums. And on our album, we, we covered one of the songs from that album, uh, uh you don't realize. Yeah, right, right, right. Um, that Which is a great is, uh, a Mike yeah. Bloomfield tune. Yeah, Bloomfield tune. You know, I speak to Harvey every now and then. He's living in Israel now. Do you know that? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. We're... yeah he's been there for a while, and um, he's put out a, uh, an interesting album about a year ago. Um, yeah, yeah. See, he's still doing it. I mean, there too. You know, I mean, he what a he told me a great Miles Davis story. You know, he did Bitches Brew. Yes, and uh, he said he walked into the studio with his bass, and uh, Miles says to him. Uh, are you just a fat fuck or do you know how to play that thing too? <laughs> uh, well, there's like, you know, there's so many great miles. There's, I mean, two of my favorite miles stories. One that somebody told me, somebody caught him after a show and said, Miles, you know, like, like you sounded great. You were killer. You know, he goes, yeah, but how'd I look? <laughs> yeah, how'd I look? Yeah, I heard some great stories too about Miles. He, um, uh, what's his name, Daryl Jones, the guy's playing bass for the Stones now. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, Daryl, um, buddy, uh, uh, um, Miles calls him like on a Saturday, and he says to him, "I need a bass player next weekend. I'm going on tour. When can you get get down here?" So um, Daryl says to him, "I'll be there by Friday." And Miles <laughs> says to him, "What the fuck are you walking here?" <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a, you know, you might know this story. It's a great story, you know, where uh, Coltrane was playing with him, uh-huh. and and Train took the solo, and he just kept like, you know, doing chorus after yeah. chorus. You yeah. know, it was yeah. like he, he he really blew for a long time. Yeah. So after, it, it after the song, you know, Miles went up to him and he said, you know, what the hell was that? He just kept playing. Yeah. And Coltrane said, like. I couldn't figure out how to end the solo, and Miles yeah. said, "Take the fucking horn out of your mouth." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's around. And also, um, you know, he he was booked at uh, in the Fillmore West with Steve Miller, right? And Steve Miller was the um, closing act. So uh, Miles says, told Bill Graham, "We should be the closing act. That guy can't play shit." And, <laughs> and, and Graham says, "Well, I'm sorry, you know, Steve Miller is the closing act." So uh, Miles, what happened was the show starts and the Miles doesn't show up. The whole band just doesn't show up. They don't. There's nobody on stage. And finally, uh, uh, Graham says to us, uh, Steve Miller, "Okay, you might as well get out there and, and start your show." And uh, <laughs> Miles said, "Somebody in the audience, go to the pay phone and call him." Okay, the white guy's on now, and he brought the band <laughs> in after. <laughs> 
Well, it's well, only one mile. Only one mile. So yeah. So anyway, um, so how you doing? This whole COVID thing like screwed everything up, huh? This whole thing. Well, you know, it shut down the whole entertainment industry. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's. Uh, I mean, never, never in my lifetime has Broadway been shut down for over a year yeah mm. i know it, it, and all these clubs and all these guys you know listen i understand i i completely understand i mean it's why dion's gigs kept getting canceled and rescheduled it's it's like i could see you know somebody could give me free tickets right i mean you know not now things are opening up again but you know in the you know say a year ago somebody could have offered me free tickets yeah. at the, the, to go to the garden to hear any number of people who I'd love to, you know, Paul McCartney say, you know, I'd love to see Paul McCartney. Like, but the question, the question I'd have would have had would have been like, you know, do I want to like to be sitting in the middle of like twenty thousand people I know. with somebody on either side and then back and in front? Yeah. Do I feel like risking my life to go to a concert? And I the know. answer would be no. No. I know. You know, no matter how much I want to go, like, is is it worth risking my life? I know. And and unfortunately, that's why all these different venues like haven't had, didn't have live music for all that time, and some a number of them still don't. Right. I know. You know, I mean, like uh, Mohican Sun Arena is sure. one of the sites that uh, you know Dion would play every year and stuff it's like you know it's ten thousand seater like you know how many people they they still haven't opened that up because i know again you know people are cautious and they don't necessarily want to sit in the middle of ten thousand people like you know it's it's still risky when are uh you guys gonna when once you do get out on the road are any uh um west coast shows Nothing on the West Coast at the moment, although I certainly hope so because yeah, I, do too. I, I have I have some some long time close friends out there. Yeah, I know. hope you enjoyed this episode of Fly on the Wall podcast. Stay tuned for some great additions to the site as well. We are listener funded, and if you wish to help keep the show going, our PayPal info is New Mexico DJ Service at Gmail dot com. That's New Mexico DJ service at gmail.com. We wish to thank you in advance for any contributions. Stay well and be nice to one another.